Do you wonder what heaven looks like? What an incredible opportunity it would be to peer into the throne room of God and witness what is going on in heaven. Isaiah is given the opportunity, and after spending some time there, he reports back to us what he saw while he was there. The common conception of heaven in modern times depicts inhabitants as winged beings who play harps and fly through the sky. In the texts, we won't find anything remotely similar to that. Therefore, throw out all of your preconceived notions about what heaven is like and make room in your head to receive Isaiah's vision. Studying the book of Isaiah will provide you with many interesting insights. To begin, the records of Isaiah's prophecy are among the most well-documented of all the Old Testament books. Isaiah was a prophet who lived in Jerusalem and was sent by God to communicate with the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem. He began by proclaiming a message of the judgment of God. He warned the corrupt leaders of Israel that their disobedience against their covenant with God would have consequences. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Amplified Bible. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw in a vision the Lord sitting on a throne, high and exalted, with the train of his royal robe filling the most holy part of the temple. Above him, seraphim, heavenly beings, stood. Each one had six wings. With two wings he covered his face, with two wings he covered his feet, and with two wings he flew. There is a throne in heaven, and the Lord God, in his role as the supreme ruler of everything, sits upon it. The fact that there is already someone sitting on the throne in heaven is the most important aspect of the heavenly realm. Those who have the rightful authority and the right to rule sit on thrones. Isaiah was not the only one who had a vision of the throne of God. In 1 Kings 22, the prophet Micaiah saw the throne of God. In Lamentations chapter 5, the prophet Jeremiah saw the throne of God. Ezekiel saw God's throne in Ezekiel 1. Daniel saw God's throne in Daniel 7. The Apostle John saw God's throne in Revelation 4. In point of fact, the book of Revelation could just as easily be referred to as the book of God's throne, due to the fact that the throne of God is specifically mentioned in that book more than 35 times. It's possible that Isaiah became discouraged or depressed as a result of the death of a prominent figure in the kingdom of Judah during his ministry. God in heaven now shows Isaiah as if to say, don't worry about it, Isaiah. Uzziah may not be on his throne, but I am on my throne. We read, above it stood seraphim. The seraphim surround the throne of God in this passage. These angels are referred to as cherubim in Psalm and Ezekiel, as well as in a number of other passages. According to Revelation chapter 4, verse 6, these angels are also referred to as living creatures. Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. And in front of the throne there was something like a sea or large expanse of glass, like the clearest crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living creatures who were full of eyes in front and behind, seeing everything and knowing everything that is around them. In Revelation 4, 8, the Apostle John also mentions their six wings. Seraphim are one of two types of heavenly beings mentioned by Isaiah, the other being cherubim. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 16, Amplified Bible. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Cherubim have a single pair of wings, are associated closely with the throne, presumably as guardians, while the seraphim are flying above it. Seraphim wings, their meaning and significance. Two wings to cover their faces, the seraphim may cover themselves with four of their six wings to express their humility before God. These burning angels, in particular, may use a pair of wings to cover their faces to show God's reverence, believing themselves unworthy to look upon God's face, and also in obedience to the Lord's admonition that no one may see his face and live. Two wings to cover their feet. The seraphim's use of a single pair of wings to cover their feet may also indicate their reverence for God, as the angels may refuse to reveal any unclean aspects of their being before the Lord. Two wings to fly. The seraphim use their remaining two wings to fly and wait upon God. This detail Isaiah gives us of the seraphim utilizing the majority of their six wings to revere God. 
The word seraphim comes from the Hebrew word for burning, which may be why some people connect them with lightning. However, in other contexts, the seraphim are associated not with fire, but with serpents, which may be a reference to the metaphoric burn of venom. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 6. A mournful, inspired oracle, a burden to be carried concerning the beasts of the Negev, the south. Through a land of trouble and anguish, from where come lioness and lion, viper and fiery flying serpent. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And one called out to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, and the temple was filling with smoke. In this context, the seraphim are not speaking directly to the Lord God. They are praising his glorious character to one another in the presence of the Lord. We read that the house was filled with smoke. This smoke brings to mind the pillar of cloud that indicated the presence of God, the smoke that was seen on Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, and the cloud of God's Shekinah glory that filled the temple. A cloud of glory often marks the presence of the Lord. Exodus chapter 19, verse 18. Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of ceremonially unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When Isaiah saw the angel's holy regard, obedience, and praise for God, he realized that he was not only different from the Lord God, but also different from the angels. We read, For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. From the outside, Isaiah looked like a good, godly man. Yet when he saw the king sitting on his throne, the Lord of hosts, he realized how corrupt he was in contrast. Isaiah's blameless life took on a quite different appearance when set against the backdrop of God's absolute perfection. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. These angelic beings surrounding the throne of God ministered to Isaiah. One flew to Isaiah with a live coal. It was so hot that even an angel had to use tongs from the altar. The throne is reserved exclusively for God, who rules and reigns from there. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 7. He touched my mouth with it and said, Listen carefully, this has touched your lips. Your wickedness, your sin, your injustice, your wrongdoing is taken away and your sin atoned for and forgiven. We read, And he touched my mouth with it. A searing hot coal was pressed to his lips, which is one of the more sensitive regions of the body. This must have been excruciating, but there is no indication in the text that Isaiah experienced any physical discomfort. Isaiah knew he did not serve the Lord like these seraphim, the burning ones. So God said, I will light a fire in you also. That is why a burning coal was used to purify Isaiah. Jehovah, who is a consuming fire, can only fitly be served by those who are on fire, whether they be angels or men. Spurgeon Isaiah's sin had to be burned away. The fire of judgment was applied to his place of sin. This was obviously a spiritual transaction. The phrase, holy, 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 appears in the Bible twice, once in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, and once in the New, Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Both times the phrase is spoken or sung by heavenly creatures, and both times it appears in a vision of a man being brought to God's throne, first by the prophet Isaiah and subsequently by the apostle John. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The holiness of God is the most difficult of all God's traits to express. Holiness is not something we inherit as a part of our nature. We only become holy in relationship to Christ. It's a sanctity that's been ascribed to you. It is an imputed holiness. Only in Christ do we become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 
He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God, that is, we would be made acceptable to him and placed in a right relationship with him by his gracious loving kindness. God's holiness is what distinguishes him from all other beings, what separates him from everything else. God's holiness is more than just his perfection or sinless purity. It is the essence of his otherness, his transcendence. God's holiness represents the mystery of his awesomeness and causes us to gaze in wonder at him as we begin to comprehend just a little of his majesty. In his vision depicted in Isaiah 6, Isaiah witnessed personally God's holiness. Isaiah, while being a prophet of God and a blameless man, was aware of his own sinfulness. Isaiah and John, on the other hand, paint a united picture of our holy, magnificent, and glorious God who does not change, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's holiness is eternal, just as He is eternal. The seraphim, in fact, spend their days and nights worshiping God for His holiness. During this never-ending worship, they exclaim, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. The significance of the seraphim's close proximity to God, combined with a revelatory praise, cannot be overstated. When the seraphim say, the whole earth is full of His glory, they are giving a first-hand account of what they see from heaven's apex. We can see from the seraphim's supernatural perspective that God's glory is infinite, indescribably valuable, and so powerful that it cannot be contained in a single realm. His glory bursts through heaven, unfolds through the spiritual realm, and overflows into the entire earth. This revealed glory allows us to catch a sacred glimpse of a holy God. To be holy means to be distinguished and revered. This thrice invocation of the word holy to describe God's sacred nature appears only twice in the Bible, both times by angels to someone transported in a vision to God's throne. The Trihagion, the thrice invocation of holy, in the seraphim's worship of God is significant. It is significant that the seraphim in Isaiah's vision use a threefold repetition of God's holiness, known as the Trihagion. The number three represented completeness and stability in ancient Judaism, and it is used here to connote God's wholeness as the beginning, middle, and end. Announcing God's holiness three times implies God's eternal nature, which is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and today, and forever. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. God's divine perfection as manifested in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God's total and supreme holiness, unrivaled by anything or anyone. So what are we to take away for ourselves today in reading these vivid images of the throne room of God? Number one, God remains active. It is a common misconception that after creating the world, God sits back and let things run their course without getting involved. God is seated on the throne and, contrary to popular belief, he is not dozing off there. There has been no break in God's activity. God is not only aware of what is taking place, but he is also actively involved. The rumblings and lightning flashes emanating from his throne represent God exercising his authority and sending judgments out throughout the world. Number 2. See the Lord in His Splendor Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2, Amplified Bible this is what the Lord says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house that you could build for me? And where will my resting place be? For all these things my hand has made. So all these things came into being by and for me, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look graciously, to him who is humble and contrite in spirit and who reverently trembles at my word and honors my commands. Be struck by the glory of the Lord. Understand what he asks of his people since he is the almighty God. He demands submissiveness from us, a yielding heart that trembles at the very words of God and desires to obey. Number three, the greatness of God. One should instead place all the details in the broader perspective of their function. 
to reveal the greatness of God's court, hence his own greatness. Thus, they also show striking contrast with the pretense of the earthly ruler's arrogant pomp. The text invites us to worship, today no less than at its first reading in Ephesus. It also invites us to relinquish our fear of human grandeur, which pales before the majesty of the eternal God with whom we have become intimate. Number 5. Invitation to Praise The manner that these beings worship compels us to offer praise in a manner similar to theirs. Worship that focuses on God's worthiness, both His character and deeds, is our closest foretaste of heaven in the present life. Psalm chapter 150, verse 2, Amplified Bible. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to the abundance of His greatness. Worship also reminds us that whatever else our calling or gifts now, all Christians become God's worshipers. Our devotion to God will always rise. The seraphim also minister to the Lord and serve as His agents of purification, as demonstrated by their cleansing of Isaiah's sins before he began his prophetic ministry. God created seraphim as sinless creatures, but they are not to be confused with God. The fact that seraphim must cover their faces to protect themselves from the blinding light of God's presence demonstrates how insignificant their sinless nature is in comparison to the Lord's transcendent purity. In Revelation 4, John's vision of God's throne was similar to that of Isaiah. In reverence and awe of the Holy One, living creatures gathered around the throne and cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Amplified Bible. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a war trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. At once I was in special communication with the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. John goes on to describe these creatures constantly surrounding God's throne with glory, honor, and reverence. Interestingly, John's reaction to the vision of God seated on his throne differs from that of Isaiah. There is no record of John collapsing in terror and becoming aware of his own sinful state, possibly because he had already encountered the risen Christ at the start of his vision. The seraphim's ministry is to extol the name and character of God in heaven. Because they are positioned above the throne, their ministry is directly related to God and His heavenly throne, as opposed to the cherubim who are beside it. The seraphim's functions have not always been agreed upon by Bible scholars, but one thing is certain, they are constantly glorifying God.